Hi, I'm Matt Shepard, and coming up on this edition of Shep Shower and Shave, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the takeaway from preseason game number one, the Lions in Indianapolis on Sunday. Shep Shower and Shave is brought to you by Fifth Avenue in Royal Oak. They are your fantasy football draft headquarters. League commissioners, here's what you get when you reserve your draft party at Fifth Avenue. A private area with free Wi-Fi, you get a draft board, you get a dedicated server to just you and your league participants, a large pizza, drink and food specials for your league and a fifth avenue fantasy football playbook for each person with 17 weeks of special fifth avenue deals it's the best deal you will ever find and it's easy to sign up for your team your draft day your draft time you send your request to fantasy draft party at fifth avroyaloak.com that's fantasy draft party at fifth avroyaloak.com we're also brought to you by northwestern tech northwestern tech is HVAC leader, okay? That's what they are. They teach it. That's all they do. They've perfected it. They've got a hands-on program for the last 38 years. You can get trained, certified, and into the field at Northwestern Tech in only 10 and a half months. Call them 248-358-4006. And we're brought to you by Nate Noth Designs. He's the one who crafted the good-looking Shep Shower and Shave logo. You can follow his work on Instagram and on Facebook. Before we get into the Lions... On Thursday night at 6 o'clock, come watch Shep Shower and Shave. We'll have Lomas Brown at 5th Avenue. We'll be out there on the patio deck. They've got over 36 cold beers on tab, great food, drink specials, kitchen open that's two, until 2 a.m. Come see us out there at 5th Avenue. All right, Lions easily beat the Indianapolis Colts. I don't think that's the bottom line. Who cares if you win or lose? You want to see how guys are progressing. You want to see who's doing well. You want to try and stay as healthy as you possibly can. And you want to see how prepared your team is. And I thought Detroit, and quite honestly, I was in Indianapolis on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I saw the dual sessions between the two organizations. I, I didn't think there was any question. First of all, they were well run, all right? I mean, really nice hospitality on the part of the Colts. They did a wonderful job of uh, giving us access. Um, it sure looked like both teams benefited from the dual practices. But I didn't think there was any question that Detroit had the better roster and that they were better coached. Now, that's not just Jim Caldwell. I'm talking about in general, okay? Because what I like to do when I go to practice is I go to a number of different stations. I want to see defensive linemen working. I want to see offensive linemen working. The easy thing to do is just go watch quarterback step back and spin it, right? I want to see how everybody works. I want to see the different techniques. I want to see the different drills that they run. And don't kid yourself. For the most part, you go to an NHL practice, and I've been to a number, you will see um, pretty much the same drills, okay? But it's the number of reps, it's the concentration on technique, it's the concentration on the little things that oftentimes make the difference. And I just thought Detroit looked like a better prepared team. That doesn't tell you right now that, oh my gosh, the Lions are ready to win the division. Oh my gosh, the Lions are ready to go to the Super Bowl. That's not what I'm saying, okay? Because let's be honest here. The Indianapolis Colts are not a very good football team. I mean, they're just not. When you, when you look, when all is said and done, uh, in the AFC South, Houston's better than they are, and Tennessee's better than they are, I think. I don't think that's a team that's going to make the playoffs. Um, we, we saw a, a Lions team beat the snot out of Indianapolis, and I know what people would be saying. Well, they didn't have two of their starting offensive linemen because Anthony Costanzo didn't play. He's their left tackle. Ryan Kelly, their starting center, did not play. And their best player in general... Andrew Luck did not play. You also didn't see T.Y. Hilton, and you didn't see a, a few other people. I, I get all that. But remember this. Detroit didn't have Taylor Decker. Um, Detroit didn't have T.J. Lang. Detroit didn't have Theo Riddick. They didn't play Darius Slay. They didn't have Eric Ebron. There's plenty of guys for the Lions who did not participate in uh, the, the Sunday preseason opener. But when you look at it, I thought for sure Detroit looked much crisper. That doesn't mean they can't be better, okay? And I'm not going to take too much out of week one in the preseason, but I thought it was pretty evident. Special teams coverage was better, and it wasn't perfect on every single one, and it's not supposed to be, all right? There is no perfect quarter. There is no perfect half. There is no perfect game in football, maybe in, in any sport. 
you know, obviously, unless there's a perfect game by a pitcher, but you, you understand my point. So when you looked at it, I thought Detroit was the much better prepared team. I thought they were the deeper team. I don't think there's any question about that, but there are still some concerns. Let's get to some good things first and foremost. The first thing that jumps out at you, it's the combination of Kenny Galladay and Jake Rudock. All right, now, we've talked about Kenny Galladay before. There are a lot of people who didn't know who he was, and the reason they didn't know who he was is because Kenny Galladay played football at Northern Illinois over the last two years. But Kenny Galladay also had well over 2,000 yards in those two seasons, okay? And it's, it's, it's a good league. I, I've told this to people for years. If you want an opportunity, and I, I, I'm not telling you to, to stop watching Michigan or Michigan State. You, you, you do have a choice. You can watch more than one football game. If you follow the Mac a little bit, you'll see that there are a lot of good players coming out of those programs. Right? You look at the field on Sunday and you see the various players from the Mid-American Conference who are playing, whether it be Galladay or Michael Roberts or Storm Norton or T.J. Lank. Of course, he didn't play Sunday, but he's from the Mid-American Conference, right? Nick Ballore is from the Mid-American Conference, and he started, uh, I think, 15 games for San Francisco a year ago. Um, you look at Indianapolis, they've got some Mac guys as well. It's a good league. Kenny Galladay, who started his career at North Dakota and caught almost 100 passes for over 1,300 yards, over the last two years was at Northern Illinois, was a first-team All-Mac. He's the only receiver in Northern Illinois history to catch enough passes to garner over 1,000 yards in back-to-back seasons. And that's saying something because Northern Illinois' offense primarily is that run option with the quarterback. They oftentimes, more oftentimes than not, Jordan Lynch, for example, a very good running quarterback. So they pull it, they tuck it, and they go a lot of times. But he has a knack for going out and getting 50-50 balls. What I like most about what coaches tell me about Kenny Galladay is he wants to compete at every single drill, every single time. Now, I know for a lot of you it's like, well, of course, that's what you should be doing. You're in the NFL, for crying out loud. You should want to win. You should want to go after every single football that's in the air. Some guys don't always give you that. There is an old saying. I think Jeff Blaschel told me this. He wants to know about the gas effort. In other words, the give a shit. How much do you really care? Kenny Galladay seems to care a great deal. So his day was very productive, not just because of the two touchdowns, it's because of how he caught those two touchdown passes. One was a back shoulder throw, really good throw by Jake Rudock, the second one. The first one was all Kenny Galladay. Another guy I thought was pretty good, obviously, Anthony Zettel. Anthony Zettel has greatly improved. He worked out in Pittsburgh in the offseason. He has worked to strengthen his core and his lower body. He's always had a high motor. And a guy who was a sixth-round draft pick out of West Branch, Michigan, played at Penn State, stuck it out through Penn State's adversity, has been among the best players in Lions camp, all training camp. If you had to pick an offensive player, I would say it's between Rick Wagner and Matthew Stafford. If you had to pick a defensive player, I would say it's Anthony Zettel. It's as simple as that. Rick Wagner hasn't been beaten, I think, in a one-on-one drill all year long. And when I watched him on Thursday and Friday against Indianapolis, whether it be a combo drill with a guard or by himself, he won every single one. So Anthony Zettel's the guy who jumped out at me, you, at, at me defensively because of the pressures that he was able to apply. Anybody who didn't recognize that wasn't watching the game closely enough. The other, another defensive lineman, Ashawn Robinson. And, and this, this starts a little bit of a trend that's a very good trend if you're a Lions fan. That trend is that you're seeing some defensive linemen be among the more impressive players in the game and or practices. Ashawn Robinson is the second year pro out of Alabama. He was a second round pick a year ago. He had seven passes defended last year. That was tied for third most among NFL defensive interior linemen. Pretty impressive. And he had two more. On top of that, he was able to hit the quarterback. He was able to hurry the quarterback two other times. So for me, Ashawn Robinson stood out. There are other guys, Jeremiah Villalaga, Alex Barrett, who flashed some speed and some strength and agility. And that's really good. Okay, That's important. However... Are they going to be a key guy in the mix 
for Detroit's hopefully improved defensive line and improved quarterback pressures, quarterback sacks, I don't know. I don't want to count on Jeremiah Voluaga or Alex Barrett, with all due respect. I'm hoping that Jordan Hill brings some of that. I'm hoping that Anthony Zettel brings some of that. I'm hoping that Ashawn Robinson and Haloti Nada and guys like that fill out too. Maybe a guy like Jeremiah Ledbetter. But anyway, they still turned your head a little bit. If you didn't know who Jeremiah Voluaga was or Alex Barrett was, you probably do now. Right, um, another guy who I thought was pretty good, and it, you got to give him a, a little bit of credit because they didn't really go his way all that much. And when they did, Tease Tabor made some plays. I and mean, Tease Tabor was very good in coverage. He had twenty three coverage snaps. Okay, they threw his way four times. They completed two passes, but they were only for ten yards. So that's pretty good. He's a guy who Jim Caldwell says is immensely football savvy. I mean, he knows it. He studies it. He gets it. He is in perfect position for the most part on just about every single play. Now, does he have the speed that a lot of elite corners, the Daryl Greens of the past it? No, he doesn't. But he makes up for it in smarts. He knows where the ball is going for the most part. He studies it well. He anticipates it well. And he has very good instincts. So Tease Tabor, for the first game now, just for the first game, was pretty impressive. Offensively, I mentioned Galladay. Obviously, Jake Rudock looked pretty good, too. He looks extremely confident. He told me earlier this year during training camp that it is, I mean, it's night and day. And you've heard that cliche before, but this is a guy who last year, it was at times a little overwhelming. This year, he gets it. Same offense, same coordinator, gets the terminology. And he thought last year's practice sessions, even as a practice squad member, were really helpful for him. And that's why, you know, the NFL is smart. I mean, they extended their practice squad to 10 guys. That's one of those situations that really helps an individual and will eventually probably help a franchise. I thought Greg Robinson was pretty good. Greg Robinson is right now your starting left tackle. Do you miss Taylor Decker? Absolutely. Is Greg Robinson as good as Taylor Decker? No, he is not. But Taylor Decker is not coming back for at least six weeks. So get that through our heads. We've got to figure out who's going to anchor the left side of the offensive line. Cyrus Quanjo has not been very good in camp, and he's been hurt. Greg Robinson, quite honestly, hasn't been all that great in camp either, but he's gotten a little bit better. And in talking with Jim Caldwell throughout the weeks, but especially before the game on Sunday, just loves this guy's footwork. He has elite footwork. His athleticism is off the charts for a man that size. He is a huge human being. And Jim Caldwell told me when I asked him, you always hate to, you hesitate to ask coaches who a guy is as good as because that's not always fair to the player. So Jim Caldwell oftentimes refers to just guys he's coached and who a guy may remind him of. Tease Tabor. A little like Machine Mathis. Greg Robinson, a little like Tarek Glenn, formerly of the Indianapolis Colts. If he could be that for the Lions, you'd take it in a minute. No question. Um, so you'd love to have a problem where Taylor Decker comes back. Robinson's been playing lights out. I don't know if that's necessarily going to get hit, going to be uh, the, the situation. But he allowed just, according to uh, Pro Football Focus, allowed just one pressure on 25 pass-blocking situations, no quarterback hits, and no quarterback sacks. So I, I, from an offensive and a positive standpoint, those are the guys I look at. Uh, from a negative standpoint, uh, I, and I like this kid. I liked him a lot in college. I still think he's going to be a very good player. But I do worry a little bit right now about Michael Roberts and the drops and, and the fumbles. Not the drops, more the fumbles. Uh, he fumbled once. It was ruled a completion. The forward momentum was stopped. It's, it was a ridiculous call. It allowed the Lions to keep the football, but it was a ridiculous call. You and I would have been complaining if that call went against the Lions. It was a fumble. There was another time where he shoved two guys aside, get to, gets out of bounds, had the ball stripped again. All right. He also dropped a pass, and that's a problem. It, the, it, trust is a huge word for parents and kids, for bosses and employees, 
and for quarterbacks and receivers. And if you're not going to be able to trust him, now he, remember this: he didn't lose a fumble in his years at Toledo. In his four years at Toledo, he did not lose one fumble. He is a big kid, and it's an incredible story. It, it's a it's a heartwarming and, and very uplifting story, and how he was able to become not just a pro, but how he was able to become a a college football player in the first place. This was a very good athlete in high school. He had a, uh, a, a, a scholarship to Ohio University. Um, he lost his grandmother. Um, his father was in jail, and his, and his grandmother was extremely influential in his life. Um, but he lost her to cancer four days prior to Christmas, his senior year in high school. He lost a younger brother to a, to a gunshot wound, okay? Um, so it, he really wasn't motivated. And then two weeks before he was expected to leave for Ohio University, uh, they pulled the offer because the grades weren't good enough. So he walked on to Toledo, sat out a year, worked on his grades, worked at a restaurant, DJed parties, sold knives, waited tables, he promised his grandmother before she died that he's going to graduate from college. Okay, He takes six laminated birthday cards she sent him, and he keeps them in his locker, and he takes them with him on the road. That's pretty cool. And, and Matt Stafford had him out to his house in Georgia to work in the offseason. Mm-hmm. It's not like he hasn't worked much. Okay, He's been working really hard. But the problem is he's not securing the football, and th- th- that can't last if you want to be out there and expected to be in the offense very long. So I was a little disappointed with that. Obviously, you're a little disappointed with what's going on in the interior of that offensive line right now. Um, I, I thought Graham Glasgow last year was, uh, was, was pretty darn good. Okay, He wasn't great. He wasn't a pro bowler. But I thought he was pretty darn good. This year, he has not picked up where many people thought he would have from a year ago, okay? I mean, they, they thought it was just going to pick it up and, and keep going. And that's not been the case. That can't happen either because there is, they're very thin in that regard. And obviously, um, <laughs> that's a problem because you're, you're not putting Lakin Tomlinson in there, okay? You're just not. Lakin Tomlinson is, has, has had a really rough camp, really rough. Uh, there's nobody from a running standpoint that, that really stood out for me. Um, it, it, Jared Davis, who had, uh, I, I think, the first tackle on the first play from scrimmage, didn't jump off the tape for you. But I don't worry about him because I'm looking at the last couple of weeks more so than I would look at just one game. The ugly from Sunday is pretty obvious, and that's the loss of Kerry Hyder. This is a huge blow, I think, for this team. Now, what do they do? What do they do about it? Now, in case you weren't aware, Kerry Hyder, first uh, quarter, second defensive series, um, basically blows out his Achilles. It's expected to end his season. And it's really too bad because he had a team high eight and a half sacks a year ago. The Lions, as I've, uh, as I've pounded the desk on for, for a long time now, need pass rushers. They, they don't have them. Last year, they had 26 sacks. That's it. 26. That, 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 that ranks 30th in the league. Okay, Their quarterback pressure or sack ability was as bad as their ability to run the football last year. That's troubling. And now you've lost a guy who led your team in sacks last year, I, I know it was a surprise. It was a surprise for everybody. Look, for three straight years, the Lions have had these types of surprises. Think about it. Two years ago, it was Devin Taylor. He came out of nowhere. He was great. Three years ago, um, it was somebody else. So um, you got Kerry Hyder here, and he's not coming back. Is it going to be Brandon Copeland? Oh, we'd love to see him, but Brandon Copeland got injured on Sunday as well. So that's a bit of an issue. What do you do? You got to go out and you got to find somebody, right? Or it's got to come from within. And I, I don't think that's going to happen. Here's, here would be a great solution. If you could somehow, some way, get Ziggy Ansa on the damn field. If you could find a way 
that Ziggy Ansah would be dressed in something other than sweats, that would be fantastic. How are you going to do that? I don't know. Because nobody, nobody truly knows the extent of his injury. Okay? So in order for this team to have any hope of getting to the quarterback, I mean, think about this for a second. Are you going to, are you really, and I, I think Anthony Zettel's been really good, but you, is that who you want to go into? Is that what you, into the, going into the season, is that what you want? You, you expect Anthony Zettel to be your leading sacker? It was a great story last year for Kerry Hyder, but they didn't have any press rush. So even if Anthony Zettel picks up where Kerry Hyder let, let off, left off, and it's eight and a half sacks, it's still not enough because you've got to find others, and you're not getting there with your linebackers. You couldn't get there last year with your linebackers. Whitehead's not getting there. Maybe Jared Davis, that's asking an awful lot out of a rookie. And Antoine Williams is in his second year, and he was playing, he's only playing 30% of the time. He's only playing 30% of the time because most teams, 70% of their defensive packages are nickel. Okay? Because you get three wide receiver sets or double tights. So you don't necessarily have a guy like Antoine Williams out there very often. Or, and it's not going to be Paul Warlow. Sorry, man. I mean, that's, so this, this is a major concern for this team. Where do you go? Well, I, I know. I, I heard a lot of people, uh, on, uh, or I read a lot of people on social media yesterday. Oh, my gosh. You know what this means? This means we're going to have to go out. We're going to have to get Dwight Freeney. Folks, Dwight Freeney is 37 years old. All right? Now, he's a situational pass rusher, I suppose. Did a decent job. He had three sacks last year. Let's be careful here. The, the guys who are available, there's a reason they're available, okay? Paul Kruger, he had 11 sacks in 2014, really hasn't been the same since because of a back injury. Mario Williams, he's 32. He had one and a half sacks in 2015, um, or last year, I should say. But he was bad in 2015. He's had back-to-back years where it's been a massive struggle. You don't have a whole lot of options out there. That's part of the problem. And the options that are out there are getting up in age. I, I, I was talking with Dan Miller about this the other day. I thought Trent Cole, okay, he had a back injury. He was limited to seven games. He's turning 35 in October. How much more time does he have in the league? The time to make the move for a pass rusher was in the draft or earlier in free agency. Now, I hope I'm all wet here. I mean, I really do. I hope there are people who say, you know what? You're jumping the panic button a little bit too soon. There's going to be plenty of guys available, or there's going to be a guy like Alex Barrett who moves his feet well, can rush the passer um, out of San Diego State. Some people, Pro Football Focus, I think, ranked him the 14th best eligible interior defensive lineman. That's interior. We're talking about pressure from the edge. We're talking about guys like Julius Peppers in his heyday, Nick Perry, who re-signed with the Packers. Guys like that, okay? You're not finding that. Chandler Jones, for example, who re-signed with the Cardinals, five years, $83 million. They're not out there, man. You know, it's, it's like Chris Spielman said the other day to me. He was surprised that Detroit was able to get a guy like Greg Robinson and thinks it's probably his last shot in the league. And the reason it's his last true shot in the league is because teams just don't get rid of good left tackles, do they? It's hard to find what? It's hard to find lockdown corners. It's hard to find elite left tackles. It's hard to find elite quarterbacks. And it's really difficult to find pass rushers. Those are the four key positions in the NFL. How you want to rank them is up to you. You got to have a guy who can throw it. You got to have a guy who can prevent a guy from throwing it. You got a guy. Got to have a guy who can protect the guy who's throwing it. And you got to be able to have a guy who gets after the guy to pressure him while he's about to throw it. Those are the four key spots. Like it or not, that's true. Detroit's got a quarterback. Detroit's got a really good corner in Darius Slay. When healthy, I think they've got a solid left tackle in Taylor Decker, but they don't have the pass rusher. Unless number 94 takes off his hood, puts on some pads, and starts to play. 
and Ziggy Ansah right now is on the physically unable to perform list. He, he, he might as well be in the witness protection program because you, you don't see him. That's the frustration that I have right now. Now, Bob Quinn will, will be able to roll with this, I'm sure. I'm sure he'll find something to get done. Maybe there's a trade to be made. I'm not sure. But um, he's got to find somebody who's going to be able to, have to be able to get to the pass rusher or pass uh, to, the, to the passer. He's got to find a pass rush because right now the guys that you have depth-wise, whether it be Voloaga, whether it be Ledbetter, whether it be Barrett, whatever, there, there's nobody proven there. And don't give me the collegiate angle because these guys aren't high draft picks and it's not like they're, they're T.J. Watt. Okay, coming out of Wisconsin, who was an absolute menace with the Badgers and a menace in his preseason opener. You don't have that. You're you're happy that Anthony Zettel improves. And and think about this, too, folks. Anthony Zettel improved, right? Let's say he becomes as good as Kerry Hyder was a year ago. All right? Let's say he becomes the zing to Ziggy Ansah's zang. All right? Like Devin Taylor two years ago. You get Ziggy Ansah healthy on one side, 14 and a half sacks two years ago, injured all, most of all of last year, and Anthony Zettel at the other side. Though it's tough to pin your ears back and bring that type of pressure energy on every single snap. You've got to have additional guys. You've got to have more than just two guys who are going to get after the quarterback. And it, it, it's a, it, I think it's a serious concern for this team. And I don't think I'm telling you necessarily anything you don't already know. I think you believe it's a serious concern as well. I thought there were a lot of positives from the game against Sunday against the Colts. But that that loss of Kerry Hyder, and who would have ever thought that? Going into training camp last year, going into the season last year, who would have ever thought that a year after you'd be going, man, losing Kerry Hyder is going to be a huge blow. It's the production. It's the ability. It's the want to. And it's the talent. This team's got to find that next Kerry Hyder within what they have right now, maybe go out and get another situational pass rusher, a guy who I've already mentioned, a guy like Trent Cole, for example, and, and hope that he can come in and spell an Ansa or spell a Zettel. Zettel's going to have to, in order for this team to be better in that regard, and think about this now. I mean, you got Sam Bradford, who's, who's not a great quarterback, but he's very efficient. He's better than Teddy Bridgewater. Aaron Rodgers might be the best in the business. And then you got a Chicago ridiculous situation with Mike Glennon, who didn't look very good in the preseason and hasn't looked good in practice, and Mitchell Trubisky, who looked really good in the preseason. But you know, who knows if, if how he'll perform once the, the, the true bright lights are on. Detroit's got a difficult schedule this year. Think about the quarterbacks you're facing. With the quarterbacks that you're facing, if you're not going to – and this is really the case in any situation because most NFL quarterbacks, you give them time – you're in trouble, all right? You are. I mean, I, I don't care if it's Carson Palmer, you got Eli Manning, you got Matt Ryan, you got Cam Newton. What are you going to do against Cam Newton and Ben Roethlisberger? Seriously. Or even a guy like Joe Flacco or an Andy Dalton. Those are all guys you're playing outside your division. Those You're facing all of them. you got Drew Brees in New Orleans. You're going to give him that much time? He will pick your ass apart. I don't care how good Darius Slay is. I don't care how good Nevin Lawson is. I don't care how improved Quandre Diggs may be or the type of smarts that Tease Tabor has. If you can't put pressure on any of the guys I just mentioned, they will kill you by themselves. And then what have you done? Then you're asking Matt Stafford to perform another comeback win that they did a year ago, set an NFL record with eight fourth quarter comeback wins. It, it's just not happening. The, the big difference, look, you're not playing Scott Tolzien like, like you did on Sunday. Why was Detroit so good against the Colts? This is something you can take away, and that is this. Their defense put their offense in some really good situations because they limited the Colts to just 220 total yards of offense. And they were forcing them to go long, lengthy fields in order to get anywhere close. And really, until that final score, that was just a, you know, you know, a give up, who cares, whatever. They hadn't gotten past, they hadn't even gotten into Detroit's red zone. The closest they had gotten was 23. That's when Adam Vinatieri kicked a field goal. So the defense really helps the offense in that regard. Same things with special teams. Actually, special teams I thought were, were pretty darn good. 
and and quite honestly, and, and Sam Martin's a hell of a punter. You don't want to lose him, but Casey Redfern was outstanding, I thought, for the most part. So he put on some good tape. You're going to have to get pressure on quarterbacks. Th- that's just the way it is in the NFL in general, but especially when you're playing the likes that Detroit is playing this year. Those guys are proven. Those guys will kill you. This is, this is not taking on Deshaun Kaiser and Mitchell Trubisky, and you're not sure. Hell, you got Jameis Winston later on in your schedule. You give that young kid time. He's going to pick you apart. It's a serious concern. Ziggy Ons has got to get back healthy. Anthony Zettel has to keep playing the way he has been playing, and I don't see any reason why he can't, but I don't expect him to have double-digit sacks. And then somehow, some way, if you can't make a trade, and that's easier said than done, you're going to have to find a way to develop a guy or bring in a situational pass rusher, even though he may be a little bit later on in his NFL career. Shep Shower and Shea brought to you by Fifth Avenue. It's your fantasy football draft party headquarters. And it's where we're going to be, by the way, Thursday night at 6 o'clock. We're going to have Lomas Brown out. I want you to come out and see us, ask some questions, talk football with us. Lomas Brown is going to be with us on Shep Shower and Shave Thursday, 6 o'clock, 5th Avenue. All right, Their kitchen is open until 2 a.m. They've got great drink specials. They've got 36 cold beers ready for you, but they are also your fantasy football draft headquarters. Here's what you get when you take your draft party there. You get a private area with free Wi-Fi. You get a draft board. You get a large pizza. You get drink and food specials for your league. You get one dedicated server who's going to wait on you hand and foot. And each person there is going to get 17 weeks of a special Fifth Avenue deals in a fantasy football playbook. So reserve your day and time right now for your fantasy football draft party by emailing fantasydraftparty at fifthavroyaloak.com. All right? And then we're also brought to you by Northwestern Tech. Northwestern Tech is the HVAC leader. That's all they do. And they do it as bad, as good as anybody else in the business. They are the best. All you got to do is ask around. Seriously. You want to get into the field? You want to be trained? You want to be trained right? You go to Northwestern Tech in Southfield. Go ahead and ask around. They got no problem with you doing that. Ask around. Say, say to those, some of those big HVAC companies in the area, ask them, where should I go? They'll tell you Northwestern Tech. You get trained, certified, and into the field in 10 and a half months. You can go to their website, northwesterntech.edu. We're also brought to you by Nate Noth Designs. See his fabulous work on Instagram or on Facebook. He is the designer of the Shep Shower and Shave logo. We hope you can join us on Thursday, 6 o'clock at 5th Avenue, right there on the patio. Lomas Brown will be with us. We'll talk Lions football with you on another edition of Shep Shower and Shave.